Chapter 4 The remainder of my school days were no more auspicious than the first. Indeed, they were an endless project that slowly evolved into a unit, in which MC aisles of construction paper and wax crayon were expended by the state of Alabama in its well-meaning but fruitless efforts to teach me group dynamics. What Jem called the Dewey Decimal System was school-wide by the end of my first year, so I had no chance to compare it with other teaching techniques. I could only look around me. Atticus and my uncle, who went to school at home, knew everything. At least what one didn't know the other did. Furthermore, I couldn't help noticing that my father had served for years in the state legislature, elected each time without opposition, innocent of the adjustments my teachers thought essential to the development of good citizenship. Jem, educated on a half-decimal, half-dunce-cap basis, seemed to function effectively alone or in a group. But Jem was a poor example. No tutorial system devised by man could have stopped him from getting at books. As for me, I knew nothing except what I gathered from Time magazine and reading everything I could lay hands on at home. But as I inched sluggishly along the treadmill of the Maycomb County school system, I could not help receiving the impression that I was being cheated out of something. Out of what I knew not, yet I did not believe that twelve years of unrelieved boredom was exactly what the state had in mind for me. As the year passed, Released from school thirty minutes before Jem, who had to stay until three o'clock, I ran by the Radley place as fast as I could, not stopping until I reached the safety of our front porch. One afternoon as I raced by, something caught my eye, and caught it in such a way that I took a deep breath, a long look around, and went back. Two live oaks stood at the edge of the Radley lot, their roots reached out into the side road and made it bumpy. Something about one of the trees attracted my attention. Some tinfoil was sticking in a knot hole just above my eye level, winking at me in the afternoon sun. I stood on tiptoe, hastily looked around once more, reached into the hole, and withdrew two pieces of chewing gum minus their outer wrappers. My first impulse was to get it into my mouth as quickly as possible, but I remembered where I was. I ran home, and on our front porch I examined my loot. The gum looked fresh. I sniffed it, and it smelled all right. I licked it and waited for a while. When I did not die, I crammed it into my mouth, Wrigley's double mint. When Jem came home, he asked me where I got such a wad. I told him I found it. Don't eat things you find, Scout. This wasn't on the ground. It was in a tree. Jem growled. Well, it was, I said. It was sticking in that tree yonder, the one coming from school. Spit it out right now. I spat it out. The tang was fading anyway. I've been chewing it all afternoon and I ain't dead yet, not even sick. Jem stamped his foot. Don't you know you're not supposed to even touch the trees over there? You'll get killed if you do. You touch the house once. That was different. You go gargle. Right now, you hear me? Ain't neither. It'll take the taste out of my mouth. You don't nan, I'll tell Calpurnia on you. Rather than risk a tangle with Calpurnia, I did as Jem told me. For some reason, my first year of school had wrought a great change in our relationship. Calpurnia's tyranny, unfairness and meddling in my business had faded to gentle grumblings of general disapproval. On my part, I went to much trouble sometimes, not to provoke her. Summer was on the way. Gemini awaited it with impatience. Summer was our best season. It was sleeping on the back-screened porch in cots or trying to sleep in the treehouse. Summer was everything good to eat. It was a thousand colors in a parched landscape. But most of all, summer was dill. The authorities released us early the last day of school, and Jem and I walked home together. Reckon old dill will be coming home tomorrow, I said. Probably day after, said Jem. Mississippi turns him loose a day later. 
As we came to the live oaks at the Radley place, I raised my finger to point for the hundredth time to the knot hole where I had found the chewing gum. Trying to make Jem believe I had found it there, and found myself pointing at another piece of tinfoil. I see it, Scout. I see it. Jem looked around, reached up, and gingerly pocketed a tiny, shiny package. We ran home, and on the front porch we looked at a small box patchworked with bits of tin foil collected from chewing gum wrappers. It was the kind of box wedding rings came in, purple velvet with a minute catch. Jem flicked open the tiny catch. Inside were two scrubbed and polished pennies, one on top of the other. Jem examined them. Indian heads, he said. Nineteen six and Scout, one of them's nineteen hundred. These are real old. Nineteen hundred, I echoed. Say, hush a minute, I'm thinking. Jem, you reckon that's somebody's hiding place? Nah, don't anybody much but us pass by there unless it's some grown persons. Grown folks don't have hiding places. You reckon we ought to keep them, Jem? I don't know what we could do, Scout. Who'd he give em back to? I know for a fact, don't anybody go by there. Cecil goes by the back street and all the way around by town to get home. Cecil Jacobs, who lived at the far end of our street next door to the post office, walked a total of one mile per school day to avoid the Radley place and old Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose. Mrs. Dubose lived two doors up the street from us. Neighborhood opinion was unanimous that Mrs. Dubose was the meanest old woman who ever lived. Jem wouldn't go by her place without Atticus beside him. What you reckon we ought to do, Jem? Finders were keepers unless title was proven. Plucking an occasional camellia, getting a squirt of hot milk from Miss Maudie Atkinson's cow on a summer day. Helping ourselves to someone's scuppernongs was part of our ethical culture, but money was different. Tell you what, said Jem. We'll keep em till school starts, then go around and ask everybody if they're theirs. There's some bus childs, maybe. He was too taken up with getting out of school today and forgot em. These are somebody's, I know that. See how they've been slicked up? They've been saved. Yeah, but why should somebody want to put away chewing gum like that? You know it doesn't last. I don't know, Scout. But these are important to somebody. How's that, Jem? Well, Indian heads. Well, they come from the Indians. They're real strong magic. They make you have good luck. Not like fried chicken when you're not looking for it, but things like long life and good health, and passing six weeks tests. These are real valuable to somebody. I'm gonna put them in my trunk. Before Jem went to his room, he looked for a long time at the Radley place. He seemed to be thinking again. Two days later, Dill arrived in a blaze of glory. He had ridden the train by himself from Meridian to Maycomb Junction, a courtesy title, Maycomb Junction was in Abbott County, where he had been met by Miss Rachel in Maycomb's. One taxi, he had eaten dinner in the diner, he had seen two twins hitched together get off the train in Bay St. Louis and stuck to his story regardless of threats. He had discarded the abominable blue shorts that were buttoned to his shirts and wore real short pants with a belt. He was somewhat heavier, no taller, and said he had seen his father. Dill's father was taller than ours. He had a black beard, pointed, and was president of the L.A.M.P. N. Railroad. I helped the engineer for a while, said Dill, yawning. In a pig's ear you did, Dill. Hush, said Jem. What'll we play today? Tom and Sam and Dick, said Dill. Let's go in the front yard. Dill wanted the Rover boys because there were three respectable parts. He was clearly tired of being our character man. I'm tired of those, I said. I was tired of playing Tom Rover, who suddenly lost his memory in the middle of a picture show and was out of the script until the end. When he was found in Alaska, make us up one gem, I said. I'm tired of making him up. Our first days of freedom, and we were tired. I wondered what the summer would bring.
We had strolled to the front yard, where Dill stood looking down the street at the dreary face of the Radley place. I smell death, he said. I do, I mean it, he said, when I told him to shut up. You mean when somebody's dying, you can smell it? No, I mean I can smell somebody and tell if they're gonna die. An old lady taught me how. Dill leaned over and sniffed me. Jean, Louise, Finch, you are going to die in three days. Dill, if you don't hush, I'll knock you bow-legged. I mean it now. Y'all hush, growled Jem. You act like you believe in hot steams. You act like you don't, I said. What's a hot steam? asked Dill. Haven't you ever walked along a lonesome road at night and passed by a hot place? Jem asked Dill. A hot steam somebody who can't get to heaven just wallows around on lonesome roads and if you walk through him, when you die you'll be one too, and you'll go around at night sucking people's breath. How can you keep from passing through one? You can't said Jem. Sometimes they stretch all the way across the road, but if you have to go through one you say, Angel bright, life and death, get off the road. Don't suck my breath. That keeps him from wrapping around you. Don't you believe a word he says, Dill, I said. Calpurnia says that's nigger talk. Jem scowled darkly at me, but said, Well, are we gonna play anything or not? Let's roll in the tire. I suggested. Jem sighed. You know I'm too big. You can push. I ran to the backyard and pulled an old car tire from under the house. I slapped it up to the front yard. I'm first, I said. Dill said he ought to be first. He just got here. Jem arbitrated, awarded me first push with an extra time for Dill, and I folded myself inside the tire. Until it happened, I did not realize that Jem was offended by my contradicting him on hot steams, and that he was patiently awaiting an opportunity to reward me. He did, by pushing the tire down the sidewalk with all the force in his body. Ground, sky, and houses melted into a mad pallet, my ears throbbed, I was suffocating. I could not put out my hands to stop, they were wedged between my chest and knees. I could only hope that Jem would outrun the tire in me or that I would be stopped by a bump in the sidewalk. I heard him behind me chasing and shouting. The tire bumped on gravel, skeetered across the road, crashed into a barrier and popped me like a cork onto pavement. Dizzy and nauseated, I lay on the cement and shook my head still, pounded my ears to silence and heard Jem's voice. Scout, get away from there, come on. I raised my head and stared at the Radley play steps in front of me. I froze. Come on, Scout, don't just lie there. Jem was screaming. Get up, can't ya? I got to my feet, trembling as I thawed. Get the tire, Jem hollered. Bring it with you. Ain't you got any sense at all? When I was able to navigate, I ran back to them as fast as my shaking knees would carry me. Why didn't you bring it? Jem yelled. Why don't you get it? I screamed. Jem was silent. Go on. It ain't far inside the gate. Why, you even touched the house once. Remember? Jem looked at me furiously, could not decline, ran down the sidewalk, treaded water at the gate, then dashed in and retrieved the tire. See there? Jem was scowling triumphantly. Nothing to it. I swear, Scout, sometimes you act so much like a girl it's mortifying. There was more to it than he knew, but I decided not to tell him. Calpurnia appeared in the front door and yelled, Lemonade time! You all get in out of that hot sun for you fry alive. Lemonade in the middle of the morning was a summertime ritual. Calpurnia set a pitcher and three glasses on the porch, then went about her business. Being out of Jem's good graces did not worry me especially. Lemonade would restore his good humor. Jem gulped down his second glassful and slapped his chest. I know what we are going to play, he announced. Something new, something different. 
What? asked Dill. Boo Radley. Jim's head at times was transparent. He had thought that up to make me understand he wasn't afraid of Radley's in any shape or form, to contrast his own fearless heroism with my cowardice. Boo Radley, how? asked Dill. Jem said, Scout, you can be Mrs. Radley. I declare if I will. I don't think... Smatter, said Dill, still scared. He can get out at night when we're all asleep, I said. Jem hissed. Scout, how's he gonna know what we're doing? Besides, I don't think he's still there. He died years ago and they stuffed him up the chimney. Dill said, Jem, you and me can play and Scout can watch if she's scared. I was fairly sure Boo Radley was inside that house, but I couldn't prove it and felt it best to keep my mouth shut or I would be accused of believing in hot steams, phenomena I was immune to in the daytime. Jem parceled out our roles. I was Mrs. Radley and all I had to do was come out and sweep the porch. Dill was old Mr. Radley. He walked up and down the sidewalk and coughed when Jem spoke to him. Jem, naturally, was Boo. He went under the front steps and shrieked and howled from time to time. As the summer progressed, so did our game. We polished and perfected it, added dialogue and plot, until we had manufactured a small play upon which we rang changes every day. Dill was the villain's villain. He could get into any character part assigned him and appear tall if height was part of the devilry required. He was as good as his worst performance. His worst performance was gothic. I reluctantly played assorted ladies who entered the script. I never thought it as much fun as Tarzan, and I played that summer with more than vague anxiety despite Jem's assurances that Boo Radley was dead and nothing would get me. With him and Calpurnia there in the daytime and Atticus home at night. Jem was a born hero. It was a melancholy little drama woven from bits and scraps of gossip and neighborhood legend. Mrs. Radley had been beautiful until she married Mr. Radley and lost all her money. She also lost most of her teeth, her hair, and her right forefinger, Dill's contribution. Boo bit it off one night when he couldn't find any cats and squirrels to eat. She sat in the living room and cried most of the time, while Boo slowly whittled away all the furniture in the house. The three of us were the boys who got into trouble. I was the probate judge for a change. Dill led Jem away and crammed him beneath the steps, poking him with the brush broom. Jem would reappear as needed in the shapes of the sheriff, assorted townsfolk, and Miss Stephanie Crawford, who had more to say about the Radleys than anybody in Maycomb. When it was time to play Boo's big scene, Jem would sneak into the house, steal the scissors from the sewing machine drawer when Calpurnia's back was turned, then sit in the swing and cut up newspapers. Dill would walk by, cough at Jem, and Jem would fake a plunge into Dill's thigh. From where I stood, it looked real. When Mr. Nathan Radley passed us on his daily trip to town, we would stand still and silent until he was out of sight, then wonder what he would do to us if he suspected. Our activities halted when any of the neighbors appeared and once first saw Miss Maudie Atkinson staring across the street at us, her hedge clippers poised in midair. One day we were so busily playing Chapter V, Book Two of One Man's Family, we did not see Atticus standing on the sidewalk looking at us, slapping a rolled magazine against his knee. The sun said twelve noon. What are you all playing? he asked. Nothing, said Jem. Jem's evasion told me our game was a secret, so I kept quiet. What are you doing with those scissors then? Why are you tearing up that newspaper? If it's today's, I'll tan you. Nothing. Nothing what? said Atticus. Nothing, sir. Give me those scissors, Atticus said. There are no things to play with. Does this by any chance have anything to do with the Radleys? No, sir, said Jem, reddening. I hope it doesn't, he said shortly and went inside the house. Jem, shut up. 
He's gone in the living room, he can hear us in there. Safely in the yard, Dill asked Jem if we could play any more. I don't know. Atticus didn't say we couldn't. Jem, I said. I think Atticus knows it anyway. No, he don't. If he did, he'd say he did. I was not so sure, but Jem told me I was being a girl, that girls always imagine things. That's why other people hated them so. And if I started behaving like one, I could just go off and find some to play with. All right. You just keep it up then, I said. You'll find out. Atticus's arrival was the second reason I wanted to quit the game. The first reason happened the day I rolled into the Radley front yard, threw all the head. Shaking, quelling of nausea and Jem yelling, I had heard another sound so low I could not have heard it from the sidewalk. Someone inside the house was laughing. Contents Prev, next. Chapter 5 My nagging got the better of Jem eventually, as I knew it would, and to my relief we slowed down the game for a while. He still maintained, however, that Atticus hadn't said we couldn't, therefore we could. And if Atticus ever said we couldn't, Jem had thought of a way around it. He would simply change the names of the characters and then we couldn't be accused of playing anything. Dill was in hearty agreement with this plan of action. Dill was becoming something of a trial anyway, following Jem about. He had asked me earlier in the summer to marry him, then he promptly forgot about it. He staked me out, marked as his property, said I was the only girl he would ever love. Then he neglected me. I beat him up twice but it did no good, he only grew closer to Jem. They spent days together in the treehouse, plotting and planning, calling me only when they needed a third party. But I kept aloof from their more foolhardy schemes for a while, and on pain of being called a girl, I spent most of the remaining twilights that summer sitting with Miss Maudie Atkinson on her front porch. Jem and I had always enjoyed the free run of Miss Maudie's yard if we kept out of her azaleas, but our contact with her was not clearly defined. Until Jem and Dill excluded me from their plans, she was only another lady in the neighborhood, but a relatively benign presence. Our tacit treaty with Miss Maudie was that we could play on her lawn, eat her scuppernongs if we didn't jump on the arbor, and explore her vast back lot, terms so generous we seldom spoke to her. So careful were we to preserve the delicate balance of our relationship, but Jem and Dill drove me closer to her with their sad behavior. Miss Maudie hated her house. Time spent indoors was time wasted. She was a widow, a chameleon lady who worked in her flower beds in an old straw hat and men's coveralls. But after her five o'clock bath, she would appear on the porch and reign over the street in magisterial beauty. She loved everything that grew in God's earth, even the weeds, with one exception. If she found a blade of nut grass in her yard, it was like the second battle of the Marne. She swooped down upon it with a tin tub and subjected it to blasts from beneath with a poisonous substance she said was so powerful it'd kill us all if we didn't stand out of the way. Why can't you just pull it up? I asked, after witnessing a prolonged campaign against a blade not three inches high. Pull it up, child. Pull it up. She picked up the limp sprout and squeezed her thumb up its tiny stalk. Microscopic grains oozed out. Why, one sprig of nutgrass can ruin a whole yard. Look here. When it comes fall, this dries up and the wind blows it all over Maycomb County. Miss Maudie's face likened such an occurrence unto an Old Testament pestilence. Her speech was crisp for a Maycomb County inhabitant. She called us by all our names, and when she grinned, she revealed two minute gold prongs clipped to her eye teeth. When I admired them, and hoped I would have some eventually, she said, Look here. With a click of her tongue, she thrust out her bridgework, a gesture of cordiality that cemented our friendship. Miss Maudie's benevolence extended to Jem and Dill, whenever they paused in their pursuits. 
We reaped the benefits of a talent Miss Maudie had hitherto kept hidden from us. She made the best cakes in the neighborhood. When she was admitted into our confidence, every time she baked, she made a big cake and three little ones, and she would call across the street, Jem Finch, Scout Finch, Charles Baker Harris. Come here. Our promptness was always rewarded. In summertime, twilights are long and peaceful. Often as not, Miss Maudie and I would sit silently on her porch, watching the sky go from yellow to pink as the sun went down, watching flights of martins sweep low over the neighborhood and disappear behind the schoolhouse rooftops. Miss Maudie, I said one evening, do you think Boo Radley's still alive? His name's Arthur and he's alive, she said. She was rocking slowly in her big oak chair. Do you smell my mimosa? It's like angel's breath this evening. Yes, um. How do you know? Know what, child? That bee? Mr. Arthur's still alive? What a morbid question. But I suppose it's a morbid subject. I know he's alive, Jean Louise, because I haven't seen him carried out yet. Maybe he died and they stuffed him up the chimney. Where did you get such a notion? That's what Jem said he thought they did. S. 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 He gets more like Jack Finch every day. Miss Maudie had known Uncle Jack Finch, Atticus's brother, since they were children. Nearly the same age, they had grown up together at Finch's Landing. Miss Maudie was the daughter of a neighboring landowner, Dr. Frank Buford. Dr. Buford's profession was medicine, and his obsession was anything that grew in the ground, so he stayed poor. Uncle Jack Finch confined his passion for digging to his window boxes in Nashville and stayed rich. We saw Uncle Jack every Christmas, and every Christmas he yelled across the street for Miss Maudie to come marry him. Miss Maudie would yell back, Call a little louder, Jack Finch, and they'll hear you at the post office. I haven't heard you yet. Jem and I thought this a strange way to ask for a lady's hand in marriage. But then Uncle Jack was rather strange. He said he was trying to get Miss Maudie's goat, that he had been trying unsuccessfully for forty years, that he was the last person in the world Miss Maudie would think about marrying, but the first person she thought about teasing. And the best defense to her was spirited offense, all of which we understood clearly. Arthur Radley just stays in the house, that's all, said Miss Maudie. Wouldn't you stay in the house if you didn't want to come out? Yes, am um, but I'd want to come out. Why doesn't he? Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. You know that story as well as I do. I never heard why, though. Nobody ever told me why. Miss Maudie settled her bridge work. You know old Mr. Radley was a foot-washing Baptist. That's what you are, ain't it? My shell's not that hard, child. I'm just a Baptist. Don't you all believe in foot washing? We do, at home in the bathtub, but we can't have communion with you all, apparently deciding that it was easier to define primitive baptistry than closed communion. Miss Maudie said, foot washers believe anything that's pleasure is a sin. Did you know some of them came out of the woods one Saturday and passed by this place and told me me and my flowers were going to hell? Your flowers, too? Yes, ma'am. They'd burn right with me. They thought I spent too much time in God's outdoors and not enough time inside the house reading the Bible. My confidence in pulpit gospel lessened at the vision of Miss Maudie stewing forever in various Protestant hells. True enough, she had an acid tongue in her head, and she did not go about the neighborhood doing good, as did Miss Stephanie Crawford. But while no one with a grain of sense trusted Miss Stephanie, Jem and I had considerable faith in Miss Maudie. She had never told on us, had never played cat and mouse with us. She was not at all interested in our private lives. She was our friend. How so reasonable a creature could live in peril of everlasting torment was incomprehensible. That ain't right, Miss Maudie. You're the best lady I know. Miss Maudie grinned. Thank you, ma'am. Thing is, Foot washers think women are a sin by definition. They take the Bible literally, you know. 
Is that why Mr. Arthur stays in the house to keep away from women? I've no idea. It doesn't make sense to me. Looks like if Mr. Arthur was hankering after heaven, he'd come out on the porch at least. Attica says God's loving folks like you love yourself. Miss Maudie stopped rocking, and her voice hardened. You are too young to understand it. She said, but sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of, oh, of your father. I was shocked. Atticus doesn't drink whiskey, I said. He never drunk a drop in his life. Gnome, yes he did. He said he drank some one time and didn't like it. Miss Maudie laughed. Wasn't talking about your father. She said, What I meant was, if Atticus Finch drank until he was drunk, he wouldn't be as hard as some men are at their best. There are just some kind of men who, who are so busy worrying about the next world, they've never learned to live in this one, and you can look down the street and see the results. Do you think they're true? All those things they say about B, Mr. Arthur, what things? I told her. That is three-fourths colored folks and one-fourth Stephanie Crawford, said Miss Maudie grimly. Stephanie Crawford even told me once she woke up in the middle of the night and found him looking in the window at her. I said, what did you do, Stephanie? Move over in the bed and make room for him? That shut her up a while. I was sure it did. Miss Maudie's voice was enough to shut anybody up. No, child, she said, that is a sad house. I remember Arthur Radley when he was a boy. He always spoke nicely to me, no matter what folks said he did. Spoke as nicely as he knew how. You reckon he's crazy? Miss Maudie shook her head. If he's not, he should be by now. The things that happen to people we never really know. What happens in houses behind closed doors? What secrets? Atticus don't ever do anything to Jem and me in the house that he don't do in the yard. I said, feeling it my duty to defend my parent. Gracious child, I was raveling a thread. Wasn't even thinking about your father. But now that I am, I'll say this. Atticus Finch is the same in his house as he is on the public streets. How'd you like some fresh pound cake to take home? I liked it very much. Next morning when I awakened, I found Jem and Dill in the backyard deep in conversation. When I joined them, as usual, they said go away. Will not. This yard's as much mine as it is yours, Jem Finch. I got just as much right to play in it as you have. Dill and Jem emerged from a brief huddle. If you stay, you've got to do what we tell you, Dill warned. E.L. I said, who's so high and mighty all of a sudden? If you don't say you'll do what we tell you, we ain't gonna tell you anything, Dill continued. You act like you grew ten inches in the night. All right, what is it? Jem said placidly, we are going to give a note to Boo Radley. Just how? I was trying to fight down the automatic terror rising in me. It was all right for Miss Maudie to talk. She was old and snug on her porch. It was different for us. Jem was merely going to put the note on the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If anyone came along, Dill would ring the bell. Dill raised his right hand. In it was my mother's silver dinner bell. I'm going around to the side of the house, said Jem. We looked yesterday from across the street, and there's a shutter loose. Think maybe I can make it stick on the windowsill at least. Jem, now you're in it and you can't get out of it. You'll just stay in it, Miss Pris. Okay, okay, but I don't want to watch. Jem, somebody was. Yes, you will. You'll watch the back end of the lot, and Dill's gonna watch the front of the house and up the street. And if anybody comes, he'll ring the bell. That? Clear? All right then. What'd you write him? Dill said, We're asking him real politely to come out sometimes and tell us what he does in there. We said we wouldn't hurt him and we'd buy him an ice cream. You all've gone crazy, he'll kill us. Dill said, It's my idea. 
I figure if he'd come out and sit a spell with us, he might feel better. How do you know he don't feel good? Well, how'd you feel if you'd been shut up for a hundred years with nothing but cats to eat? I bet he's got a beard down to here. Like your daddy's? He ain't got a beard, he... Dill stopped as if trying to remember. Uh-huh. Kacha, I said. You said four you were off the train good your daddy had a black beard. If it's all the same to you, he shaved it off last summer. Yeah, and I've got the letter to prove it. He sent me two dollars too. Keep on. I reckon he even sent you a mounted police uniform. That never showed up, did it? You just keep on telling him, son. Dill Harris could tell the biggest ones I ever heard. Among other things, he had been up in a mail plane 17 times. He had been to Nova Scotia. He had seen an elephant. And his granddaddy was Brigadier General Joe Wheeler and left him his sword. You all hush, said Jem. He scuttled beneath the house and came out with a yellow bamboo pole. Reckon this is long enough to reach from the sidewalk? Anybody who's brave enough to go up and touch the house hadn't ought to use a fish and pole, I said. Why don't you just knock the front door down? This is different, said Jem. How many times do I have to tell you that? Dill took a piece of paper from his pocket and gave it to Jem. The three of us walked cautiously toward the old house. Dill remained at the light pole on the front corner of the lot and Jem and I edged down the sidewalk parallel to the side of the house. I walked beyond Jem and stood where I could see around the curve. All clear, I said, not a soul in sight. Jem looked up the sidewalk to Dill, who nodded. Jem attached the note to the end of the fishing pole, let the pole out across the yard, and pushed it toward the window he had selected. The pole lacked several inches of being long enough and Jem leaned over as far as he could. I watched him making jabbing motions for so long I abandoned my post and went to him. Can't get it off the pole, he muttered, or if I got it off, I can't make it stay. Gone back down the street, Scout. I returned and gazed around the curve at the empty road. Occasionally I looked back at Jem, who was patiently trying to place the note on the windowsill. It would flutter to the ground and Jem would jab it up, until I thought if Boo Radley ever received it, he wouldn't be able to read it. I was looking down the street when the dinner bell rang. Shoulder up, I reeled around to face Boo Radley and his bloody fangs. Instead, I saw Dill ringing the bell with all his might in Atticus's face. Jem looked so awful I didn't have the heart to tell him I told him so. He trudged along, dragging the pole behind him on the sidewalk. Atticus said, stop ringing that bell. Dill grabbed the clapper. In the silence that followed, I wished he'd start ringing it again. Atticus pushed his hat to the back of his head and put his hands on his hips. Jem, he said, what were you doing? Nothing, sir. I don't want any of that. Tell me. I was. We were just trying to give something to Mr. Radley. What were you trying to give him? Just a letter. Let me see it. Jem held out a filthy piece of paper. Atticus took it and tried to read it. Why do you want Mr. Radley to come out? Dill said, we thought he might enjoy us, and dried up when Atticus looked at him, son. He said to Jem, I'm going to tell you something and tell you one time. Stop tormenting that man. That goes for the other two of you. What Mr. Radley did was his own business. If he wanted to come out, he would. If he wanted to stay inside his own house, he had the right to stay inside free from the attentions of inquisitive children, which was a mild term for the likes of us. How would we like it if Atticus barged in on us without knocking, when we were in our rooms at night? We were, in effect, doing the same thing to Mr. Radley. What Mr. Radley did might seem peculiar to us, but it did not seem peculiar to him. Furthermore, had it never occurred to us that the civil way to communicate with another being was by the front door instead of a side window? Lastly, we were to stay away from that house until we were invited there, 
We were not to play an asinine game he had seen us playing, or make fun of anybody on this street, or in this town. We weren't making fun of him, we weren't laughing at him, said Jem, we were just... So that was what you were doing, wasn't it? Making fun of him? No, said Atticus, putting his life's history on display for the edification of the neighborhood. Jem seemed to swell a little. I didn't say we were doing that, I didn't say it. Atticus grinned dryly. You just told me, he said. You stop this nonsense right now, every one of you. Jem gaped at him. You want to be a lawyer, don't you? Our father's mouth was suspiciously firm, as if he were trying to hold it in line. Jem decided there was no point in quibbling, and was silent. When Atticus went inside the house to retrieve a file he had forgotten to take to work that morning, Jem finally realized that he had been done in by the oldest lawyer's trick on record. He waited a respectful distance from the front steps, watched Atticus leave the house and walk toward town. When Atticus was out of earshot, Jem yelled after him, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I ain't so sure now. Contents, Prev, next. Chapter 6 Yes, said our father when Jem asked him if we could go over and sit by Miss Rachel's fish pool with Dill, as this was his last night in Maycomb. Tell him so long for me, and we'll see him next summer. We leaped over the low wall that separated Miss Rachel's yard from our driveway. Jem whistled Bob White, and Dill answered in the darkness. Not a breath blowing, said Jem. Look a yonder. He pointed to the east. A gigantic moon was rising behind Miss Maudie's pecan trees. That makes it seem hotter, he said. Crossing it tonight? asked Dill, not looking up. He was constructing a cigarette from newspaper and string. No, just the lady. Don't light that thing, Dill. You'll stink up this whole end of town. There was a lady in the moon in Maycomb. She sat at a dresser combing her hair. We're gonna miss you, boy. I said. Reckon we better watch for Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery boarded across the street from Mrs. Henry Lafayette DuBose's house. Besides making change in the collection plate every Sunday, Mr. Avery sat on the porch every night until nine o'clock and sneezed. One evening we were privileged to witness a performance by him, which seemed to have been his positively last, for he never did it again so long as we watched. Jem and I were leaving Miss Rachel's front steps one night when Dill stopped us. Golly, look a yonder. He pointed across the street. At first we saw nothing but a kudzu-covered front porch, but a closer inspection revealed an arc of water descending from the leaves and splashing in the yellow circle of the streetlight. Some ten feet from source to any earth, it seemed to us. Jem said Mr. Avery misfigured. Dill said he must drink a gallon a day, and the ensuing contest to determine relative distances and respective prowess only made me feel left out again. As I was untalented in this area, Dill stretched, yawned, and said altogether too casually, I know what, let's go for a walk. He sounded fishy to me. Nobody in Maycomb just went for a walk. Where to, Dill? Dill jerked his head in a southerly direction. Jem said, okay. When I protested, he said sweetly, you don't have to come along, Angel May. You don't have to go, remember? Jem was not one to dwell on past defeats. It seemed the only message he got from Atticus was insight into the art of cross-examination. Scow, we ain't gonna do anything, we're just going to the streetlight and back. We strolled silently down the sidewalk, listening to porch swings creaking with the weight of the neighborhood. Listening to the soft night murmurs of the grown people on our street. Occasionally we heard Miss Stephanie Crawford laugh. Well, said Dill. Okay, said Jem. Why don't you go on home, Scout? What are you going to do? Dill and Jem were simply going to peep in the window with the loose shutter to see if they could get a look at Boo Radley. 
and if I didn't want to go with them, I could go straight home and keep my fat flopping mouth shut. That was all. But what in the Sam Holy Hill did you wait till tonight? Because nobody could see them at night, because Atticus would be so deep in a book he wouldn't hear the kingdom coming. Because if Boo Radley killed them, they'd miss school instead of vacation. And because it was easier to see inside a dark house in the dark than in the daytime. Did I understand? Jim, please. Scout, I'm telling you for the last time. Shut your trap or go home. I declare to the Lord you're getting more like a girl every day. With that, I had no option but to join them. We thought it was better to go under the high wire fence at the rear of the Radley lot. We stood less chance of being seen. The fence enclosed a large garden and a narrow wooden outhouse. Jem held up the bottom wire and motioned Dill under it. I followed and held up the wire for Jem. It was a tight squeeze for him. Don't make a sound, he whispered. Don't get in a row of collards whatever you do, they'll wake the dead. With this thought in mind, I made perhaps one step per minute. I moved faster when I saw Jem far ahead beckoning in the moonlight. We came to the gate that divided the garden from the backyard. Jem touched it. The gate squeaked. Spit on it. Whispered Dill. You've got us in a box, Jem. I muttered. We can't get out of here so easy. She spit on it, scout. We spat ourselves dry, and Jem opened the gate slowly, lifting it aside and resting it on the fence. We were in the backyard. The back of the Radley house was less inviting than the front. A ramshackle porch ran the width of the house. There were two doors and two dark windows between the doors. Instead of a column, a rough two-by-four supported one end of the roof. An old Franklin stove sat in a corner of the porch. Above it, a hat-rack mirror caught the moon and shone eerily. R R said Jem softly, lifting his foot. Smatter? Chickens, he breathed. That we would be obliged to dodge the unseen from all directions was confirmed when Dill ahead of us spelled G-O-D in a whisper. We crept to the side of the house, around to the window with the hanging shutter. The sill was several inches taller than Jem. Give you a hand up, he muttered to Dill. Wait, though. Jem grabbed his left wrist, and my right wrist, I grabbed my left wrist, and Jem's right wrist. We crouched, and Dill sat on our saddle. We raised him, and he caught the window sill. Hurry, Jem whispered. We can't last much longer. Dill punched my shoulder, and we lowered him to the ground. What did you see? Nothing. Curtains. There's a little teeny light way off somewhere, though. Let's get away from here. Breathed Jem. Let's go around and back again. Shh, he warned me, as I was about to protest. Let's try the back window. Dill, no, I said. Dill stopped and let Jem go ahead. When Jem put his foot on the bottom step, the step squeaked. He stood still, then tried his weight by degrees. The step was silent. Jem skipped two steps, put his foot on the porch, heaved himself to it, and teetered a long moment. He regained his balance and dropped to his knees. He crawled to the window, raised his head, and looked in. Then I saw the shadow. It was the shadow of a man with a hat on. At first I thought it was a tree, but there was no wind blowing, and tree trunks never walked. The back porch was bathed in moonlight, and the shadow, crisp as toast, moved across the porch toward Jem. Dill saw it next. He put his hands to his face. When it crossed Jem, Jem saw it. He put his arms over his head and went rigid. The shadow stopped about a foot beyond Jem. Its arm came out from its side, dropped, and was still. Then it turned and moved back across Jem, walked along the porch and off the side of the house, returning as it had come. Jem leaped off the porch and galloped toward us. He flung open the gate, danced Dill and me through, 
and shooed us between two rows of swishing collards. Halfway through the collards I tripped. As I tripped the roar of a shotgun shattered the neighborhood. Dill and Jem dived beside me. Jem's breath came in sobs, fenced by the schoolyard. Hurry, scout. Jem held the bottom wire. Dill and I rolled through and were halfway to the shelter of the schoolyard's solitary oak when we sensed that Jem was not with us. We ran back and found him struggling in the fence, kicking his pants off to get loose. He ran to the oak tree in his shorts. Safely behind it, we gave way to numbness, but Jem's mind was racing. We gotta get home, they'll miss us. We ran across the schoolyard, crawled under the fence to Deer's pasture behind our house, climbed our back fence, and were at the back steps before Jem would let us pause to rest. Respiration normal, the three of us strolled as casually as we could to the front yard. We looked down the street and saw a circle of neighbors at the Radley front gate. We better go down there, said Jem. They'll think it's funny if we don't show up. Mr. Nathan Radley was standing inside his gate, a shotgun broken across his arm. Atticus was standing beside Miss Maudie and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Rachel and Mr. Avery were nearby. None of them saw us come up. We eased in beside Miss Maudie, who looked around. Where were you all? Didn't you hear the commotion? What happened? asked Jem. Mr. Radley shot at a negro in his collared patch. Oh, did he hit him? No, said Miss Stephanie. Shot in the air. Scared him pale, though. Says if anybody sees a white nigger around, that's the one. Says he's got the other barrel waiting for the next sound he hears in that patch, and next time he won't aim high, be it dog nigger or Jem Finch. Ma'am, asked Jem. Atticus spoke. Wear your pants, son. Pants, sir. Pants. It was no use. In his shorts before God and everybody. I sighed. Ah, Mr. Finch? In the glare from the streetlight, I could see Dill hatching one. His eyes widened, his fat cherub face grew rounder. What is it, Dill? asked Atticus. Ah, I won em from him, he said vaguely. Won them? How? Dill's hand sought the back of his head. He brought it forward and across his forehead. We were playing strip poker up yonder by the fish pool, he said. Gemini relaxed. The neighbors seemed satisfied. They all stiffened. But what was strip poker? We had no chance to find out. Miss Rachel went off like the town fire siren. Duo Jesus, Dill Harris. Gambling by my fish pool? I'll strip poker you, sir. Atticus saved Dill from immediate dismemberment. Just a minute, Miss Rachel, he said. I've never heard of him doing that before. Were you all playing cards? Jem fielded Dill's fly with his eyes shut. No, sir, just with matches. I admired my brother. Matches were dangerous, but cards were fatal. Jem Scout, said Atticus, I don't want to hear of poker in any form again. Go buy dills and get your pants, Jem. Settle it yourselves. Don't worry, dill, said Jem, as we trotted up the sidewalk. She ain't gonna get you. He'll talk her out of it. That was fast thinking, son. Listen, you hear? We stopped and heard Atticus's voice. Not serious. They all go through it, Miss Rachel. Dill was comforted, but Jem and I weren't. There was the problem of Jem showing up some pants in the morning. D give you some of mine, said Dill, as we came to Miss Rachel's steps. Jem said he couldn't get in them, but thanks anyway. We said goodbye, and Dill went inside the house. He evidently remembered he was engaged to me, for he ran back out and kissed me swiftly in front of Jem. Y'all right, here? He bawled after us. Had Jem's pants been safely on him, we would not have slept much anyway. Every night sound I heard from my cot on the back porch was magnified threefold. Every scratch of feet on gravel was Boo Radley seeking revenge. 
Every passing Negro laughing in the night was Boo Radley loose, and after us, insects splashing against the screen were Boo Radley's insane fingers picking the wire to pieces. The chinaberry trees were malignant, hovering, alive. I lingered between sleep and wakefulness until I heard Jem murmur, Sleep, little three eyes. Are you crazy? Shh. A-H. Atticus's lights out. In the waning moonlight, I saw Jem swing his feet to the floor. I'm going after him, he said. I sat upright. You can't. I won't let you. He was struggling into his shirt. I've got to. You do and I'll wake up Atticus. You do and I'll kill you. I pulled him down beside me on the cot. I tried to reason with him. Mr. Nathan's gonna find him in the morning, Jim. He knows you lost him. When he shows him to Atticus, it'll be pretty bad, that's all there is to it. Going back to bed. That's what I know, said Jem. That's why I'm going after him. I began to feel sick. Going back to that place by himself, I remembered Miss Stephanie. Mr. Nathan had the other barrel waiting for the next sound he heard, be it nigger, dog. Jem knew that better than I. I was desperate. Look, it ain't worth it, Jem. A lickin' hurts, but it doesn't last. You'll get your head shot off, Jem. Please. He blew out his breath patiently. I, it's like this, Scout, he muttered. Atticus ain't ever whipped me since I can remember. I want to keep it that way. This was a thought. It seemed that Atticus threatened us every other day. You mean he's never caught you at anything? Maybe so, but I just want to keep it that way, Scout. We shouldn't have done that tonight, Scout. It was then, I suppose, that Jem and I first began to part company. Sometimes I did not understand him, but my periods of bewilderment were short-lived. This was beyond me. Please, I pleaded, can't you just think about it for a minute? By yourself on that place. Shut up. It's not like he'd never speak to you again or something. I'm gonna wake him up, Jem. I swear I am. Jem grabbed my pajama collar and wrenched it tight. Then I'm going with you. I choked. No, you ain't. You'll just make noise. It was no use. I unlatched the back door and held it while he crept down the steps. It must have been two o'clock. The moon was setting, and the latticework shadows were fading into fuzzy nothingness. Jem's white shirt tail dipped and bobbed like a small ghost dancing away to escape the coming morning. A faint breeze stirred and cooled the sweat running down my sides. He went the back way, through Deer's pasture, across the schoolyard and around to the fence, I thought. At least that was the way he was headed. It would take longer, so it was not time to worry yet. I waited until it was time to worry and listened for Mr. Radley's shotgun. Then I thought I heard the back fence squeak. It was wishful thinking. Then I heard Atticus cough. I held my breath. Sometimes when we made a midnight pilgrimage to the bathroom we would find him reading. He said he often woke up during the night, checked on us, and read himself back to sleep. I waited for his light to go on, straining my eyes to see it flood the hall. It stayed off, and I breathed again. The night crawlers had retired, but ripe china berries drummed on the roof when the wind stirred, and the darkness was desolate with the barking of distant dogs. There he was, returning to me. His white shirt bobbed over the back fence and slowly grew larger. He came up the back steps, latched the door behind him, and sat on his cot. Wordlessly, he held up his pants. He lay down, and for a while I heard his cot trembling. Soon he was still. I did not hear him stir again. Contents, Prev.